Okay. Thank you very much. So we're going to have time for a panel discussion if any of you have questions about that case and, and the implications. Uh, and now uh, Ariska and I are going to take you through the second case. Come on up, Ariska. So my patient brought her genetic test result in help. And we believe why we chose this case is we believe this is going to become more and more likely to happen, uh, even to a cardiologist who's never had to deal with it before. So this is a case of a 52-year-old female <clears throat> referred by her general practitioner because a direct-to-consumer genetic test that she had, which was a gift to her from her family at Christmas, uh, identified her at being at increased risk for coronary artery disease. This is the definition of a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> she's asking what she must do to reduce her risk, she's come to you, the cardiologist, and whether this test can be used by her family to inform their need for prevention. So as a good cardiologist should do, we start with the history and physical. So this is an active woman, has no symptoms whatsoever, no relevant past medical history, she's a non-smoker and takes no medications. This is really out of the blue genetic test that identifies a risk. Her mother, however, did have a stroke at age 68, which is just 10 years later than her age now, and her father had a myocardial infarction in his mid-70s. Her brother, who's younger than her, but who smoked, had an angioplasty at age 48. So there is a family history. One could argue whether it's premature or normal degenerative age onset of cardiovascular disease in first-degree relatives all over the place, parents and sibling. Her blood pressure is 138 over 84. She's overweight, BMI of 28. Her A1C is normal at 5.9, but at the upper limit of normal. Her LDL is not that high, 3.3, and her total cholesterol to HDL ratio is not that bad, 3.7. This clearly isn't an overt dyslipidemia, which can run in families. Uh, and you haven't identified something really ominous here. This is a pretty typical patient that most postmenopausal you know, patients with atypical chest pain might be presenting with. In this case, she's completely asymptomatic. Her ECG, however, which is a very common, I call this the most common general cardiology clinical referral, uh, usually, however, with some story of chest pain, shows some nonspecific anterior T-wave flattening, which those of you who practice general cardiology will know very common in perimenopausal women and often results in a lot of diagnostic testing. So audience interactive question number four. This is really to, again, take the temperature of the room. How many patients have come to your practice with a direct-to-consumer genetic test report or have asked your opinion about ordering one? So one, none, two, some, or three patients frequently have asked or brought results to my clinic, which I think would be unlikely, but our prediction would be over the next five years this might actually emerge. So here's your opportunity to answer. Okay, so this is, you know, I think very revealing. This is kind of what I would predicted, that some people have had this question asked to them or have actually encountered this where a patient has brought. But the majority of you, this hasn't happened to you yet. All right, so before I hand it over to Ariska, I thought I would give you a very quick glimpse into how busy this field is. And in fact, this is not a comprehensive list. This is actually just the beginning. On the very left-hand side is what's popular. You, hear, you see the ads on television. You see them on the back of magazines or in newspapers, and that's 23andMe. Their business is to inform you about your genetic risk for certain diseases. That's what they do. They charge $249, and they do what's called a SNP genotyping. Ariska is going to go into this in more detail. Looking for single nucleotide polymorphisms, in many ways, the postal code of the entire genome. <coughs> Not your address, but your postal code. In the middle are those companies that do a little bit more. Color is probably the most well-known for the same price. You get a little bit more information. Genos, Helix, Dante Labs, Full Genomes, 
full genome sequencing, Invitae and Veritas are probably the most, the ones with the asterisks are those that uh, on many levels are clinically approved. Ariska will talk about that more in detail. Then there are some companies where if you happen to have your sequence, you can simply submit it and get their opinion because they're annotating and forever updating what a certain sequence variation may mean in coding sequence, i.e. segments of the genome that code for genes, and even now what's emerging is information that's in the non-coding, what we used to call junk DNA, is far from junk. It actually contains important information and genome map. And insight genetics would offer not only this type of insight, but suggest ancillary testing that could be done, blood testing, etc. So a complicated field, lots of opportunity. One could see a particularly hypochondriacal patient doing more than one and bringing you more than one result in. And this, you know, you don't need a prescription for this, ladies and gentlemen. You can just send your spit in and get this result. So here's an example of something that could be pretty frightening. What if your patient, Clark, came in today with this 23andMe report, which says, Clark, you have one copy of the apolipoprotein E, or epsilon-4 variant, which is a marker of late-onset Alzheimer's disease. So perfectly healthy person now faces the prospect, doc, I'm going to get Alzheimer's. What do we do together? This is real. This is a real result that a patient can get. Or they can come in with a color report that says pathogenic mutation was identified in BRCA. BRCA is pretty well known in the commonplace. The risk for breast and ovarian cancer in women includes risk for breast cancer in men. Uh, and, uh, you know, Women with a family history may want this testing, even though the guidelines for that testing are not entirely clear, or not, uh, would not indicate that, but patients can get this directly. So with this, I'm going to turn over to Ariska. So we're switching gears a little bit here with um, this next case. In the previous case, we were talking about uh, clinically derived or standard of care genetic testing, whereas in this case, we're talking about something that, as uh, Dr. Hussein mentioned, is likely to become more and more prevalent, which is uh, patient-derived or a sort of patient-requested genetic testing. And these are not necessarily patients or people that come into your clinics with, with disease. These are also healthy individuals who are interested in practicing, um, you know, preventative medicine and, and obtaining more information about their potential genetic risks. So what is direct-to-consumer? Uh, genetic testing. Well, as we mentioned, this in general is patient initiated. So in other words, not physician mediated. Um, I will say that many companies, um, like Dr. Uh, Hussein mentioned, are sort of evolving and starting to incorporate medical professionals and healthcare professionals into their model. Um, so although it might appear that a test is ordered by a physician, we have to be careful and recognize that a lot of these companies are bringing the physicians in-house into their companies to do the ordering or con uh, consulting on these tests. Uh, this is a test that is paid for out of pocket, so this is an important point. This is not a test that is ministry approved or covered by uh, government funding. Um, and this is a test that can include genetic testing for risk factors associated with both minimal or significant uh, impact, depending on the lab or the technology used. So the etiology of cardiac disease is complex. We know there are both genetic and environmental risk factors. So uh, the genetic risk factors um, can vary. There can be significant genetic impact um, where, in, such as in the case of a genetic syndrome or a genetic disorder, or there can be more low-risk um, genetic alleles um, or associations, um, and we can have both common and rare risk alleles. In the environment, we know that there are many impacts or triggers, such as diet and stress and lifestyle. And we know that when those two come together, the interaction between those genetic environmental risk factors is when we can develop cardiac disease. So we call this multifactorial inheritance, and this can be visualized nicely using the, the CUP model by Huang et al., uh, 2017. And so here we see that there's different impact depending on the, uh, the genetic risk factor. So 
The red circle indicates a strong genetic risk factor. The blue ones are weak, and the small purple ones are the environmental factors. And the point that we see here is that combined, um, they can re reach a critical threshold for disease and develop car uh, coronary artery disease, for example. To illustrate sort of three different potential outcomes here, you can see the first one on the left, the high impact um, genetic impact is um, seen where there's a, a, a genetic risk allele such as the um, um, uh, gene associated with familial hypercholesterolemia, where it's a significant impact, and in fact, even in, on its own, a person can develop cardio, um, coronary artery disease. In the second model, you see that the individual genetic risk factors actually have a low impact, but together can add up to create the or to reach a critical threshold. And then finally, importantly, you can see that even though an individual can have a, a genetic risk factor in and of itself, they may not ever actually reach a critical threshold or develop the disease. So it's important to recognize that even having a genetic risk factor does not necessarily mean that an individual will have the disease or coronary artery disease. Sorry. So how are the labs actually going about using this um, uh, information and testing for these different types of genetic risk factors? So. Some companies that we talked about, like 23andMe, use the approach of the single nucleotide polymorphism um, test or looking for the common variants that are located um, in specific locations throughout the genome. So these types of what we call SNPs are associated with making, you know, uh, having people be unique in their appearance, in their susceptibility to disease, and even in their response to certain types of medications. So these, the yellow dots indicate um, where the specific locations across the genome, where they are, and specific labs will only actually test for those particular locations in the genome. And basically, this is what would, would incur sort of a susceptibility to disease or indicate a low impact. This is different from something like genome sequencing, which is actually looking at all of the DNA in a gene and looking for more rare type of variants that would indicate an individual may have a, a genetic disorder or genetic syndrome. And these are types of genetic changes that would have a very high impact. So taking this information, we move back to our case and to our patient. So our patient feels that they're at increased risk. And but what does increased risk actually mean? So this can mean very different things to different people depending on their perspective, of course, and can be quite intimidating and scary. And also, it can mean very different things depending on the lab that was used and the technology that was used. So here I have two different quotes of, of an increased risk from two different labs using two di very different types of technology. The first one is a quote from 23andMe, which does not go about diagnosing disease, but instead um, gives risk assessment to the patient. So here they've come back with a result that says you have a slightly increased risk of developing disorder X based on your genetic test result. On the other hand, you could have a result, the second quote is from Color, um, a pathogenic mutation was identified in the LDLR gene. Testing positive for a pathogenic mutation in this gene causes familiar, familial hypercholesterolemia. So again, you can see the difference there and the impact that the different test has, one is stating a slightly increased risk and the other is actually identifying that this individual has a genetic condition. So it's very important to understand, you know, as illustrated, what the actual test was looking at, what technology they use. So step one, what kind of test was run? This is a question you might ask yourself if a patient presents in your clinic with a report from a uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing company, step one would be what, was, what test was run and recognizing that all, not all tests are equal. Was it a test that looked for common variants or SNPs, as we've discussed, or is this a test that actually performed <coughs> genetic sequencing? So the common variant type of approach, like we've discussed with 23andMe, looks for a very specific common genetic variants. They can assess disease risk association is typically not used for diagnostic purposes and in general would not be used for family testing. 
Whereas a test that uses gene sequencing, uh, like the example we used of, of the lab color, they do look for rare genetic variants and can be used for diagnostic purposes, as well as potentially uh, could be used for, for testing family members or at-risk family members. So the next step to ask yourself would be what lab was used. So important, it's important to know whether this is a result that you can trust, has it been verified, is it accurate? So we want to know, is this a CLIA-approved lab? So the CLIA is a, a regulatory body that holds labs accountable for accuracy as well as for quality control. So it would be helpful to understand if this is, an actually, a, is this actually a CLIA-approved lab. And we also want to know, were these results actually clinically validated? And this is also a very important point. Recent studies have shown that up to 40% of results from direct-to-consumer genetic tests are erroneous. So we have to understand, again, the significance and whether we can trust this result and has it been clinically validated. Does the lab require the test to be ordered by a healthcare professional? So again, this can be helpful to understand if this was a test that was motivated more by uh, a clinician or a healthcare team, or this is motivated purely by a patient, as in our case, who is interested in, in learning about their genetic risks. So again, as I mentioned, some labs do require that the test be ordered via a doctor or a genetics professional, and this is, is occurring in some cases through private pay clinics. Other labs will accept orders directly from the patients. And lastly, when should I con consult my clinical genetics colleagues? So as we learned from the first question, um, some people actually don't have access to uh, genetic health care professionals in their community. So for, tho for those who do not, this can become a more um, difficult uh, place to be, and we have to think about how do we get access and how can we in, um, expand the genetic access to, to the community. But firstly, if you have identified that your patient has a uh, genetic disease such as in uh, FH, this would be an appropriate reason to refer to genetic services. Um, however, if not, it's possible that a referral to genetics would not be accepted. Again, ge the genetics professionals um, may not want to see an individual who has a, a low impact risk allele as the management and, and the counseling is probably not gonna change uh, drastically. But are there other risk factors such as a positive family history or abnormal blood work that might indicate uh, the presence of uh, an inherited disorder or a risk for an inherited disorder. And if this is the case, you may also want to consult or reach out to your genetic colleagues and see if a referral would be appropriate. If not, again, you want to assess how impactful is this result on its own? Is it gonna affect my management of the patient or even their family members? And lastly, do they have questions that can't be answered my, by my team? So often on a genetic testing report or a direct-to-consumer genetic testing report, there may be resources available. There may be a physician or a genetic counselor, again, that's incorporated into that company that you can reach out to for assistance. And if not, again, we have to think about how to manage the anxiety and the stress that these patients are incurring when they come to your office with this test of uh, a result that indicates our increased risk. So again, is there a role in working with the patient's a uh, healthcare team or family doctor to sort of make sure that at least everyone is on the same page about the impact that this risk actually has or this result actually has. So we want to ask you another question. So we want to ask, are there any circumstances where you should actually recommend direct-to-consumer genetic testing to your patient? So the answers are one, never. Two, maybe in the presence of a very strong family history of cardiovascular disease. Three, I would rather refer them to a genetics clinic counselor. Four, I am enthusiastic about genetics and will recommend direct-to-consumer genetic tests to my patients. Okay, so varied responses. So obviously some people feel um, 
a bit potentially uncomfortable in this territory and never uh, would, would request or recommend genetic testing or direct to consumer genetic testing. Um, whereas others would sort of would, if this is a question that comes up in their patient, would potentially um, speak to a genetic counselor or a genetic colleague to, to sort of gain more information about this kind of testing. And I think that's, that's, that's pretty fair. Thank you, Ariska. So um, 